Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. Happy Christmas, folks and goats. Peter here with your co-host, Landon. Hey guys, glad to be here. Bringing you the exciting conclusion to our first season of Duel of the Peaks. Before we get started, let's give a huge shout out to our sponsor, GameGrid, for making all of this possible. We have an affiliate link in the description, and if you want to buy any cards that you see during this video and support the channel while doing it, head to that link to purchase your singles today. If you want to support the channel directly, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash command valley to sign up today for some amazing perks like seeing these gameplay videos early and playing games with members of the command valley over discord. We've got an exciting matchup for you today bringing you the closing of a wonderful fun 12 episode season. For old time's sake, let's recap what has gotten us to this point. Start us off, episode one featured homebrews with Landon's Afara stealing everything on the board, but Caleb came out on top with six points and the first lead of the season. Episode two squared off Theros beyond death commanders against each other, resulting in Griffin getting ousted early and Landon winning again, bringing Caleb and Landon to a tie. Episode three had everyone playing tribal decks and Griffin's Edgar Markov deck overran the board quickly and netted him eight more points, bringing him to the lead. Episode Episode 4 put the Commander 2020 decks to the test, scoring Griffin another win with the Unstoppable Cathril deck. Episode 5 featured remixes of the C2020 Commanders. It was a tight game between Peter's Zyrus, Landon's Tyam, and Caleb's Jarena, but Peter was victorious in the end. Episode 6 was a core set clash featuring new and old commanders from the core sets. Griffin's Rin and Sari crater hoofed to his third victory. Episode 7 brought the new Jumpstart Commander Commanders head to head, while Caleb brought powerful creatures out to overpower and win with Naeth, Peter ended up scoring the most points with his Blinking Emil deck. Episode 8 was our Double Masters showdown, bringing back four classic commanders reprinted in Double Masters to the scene. Peter dominated with an ultra powerful Atraxas Super Friends deck, scoring every possible point that game. Episode 9 saw the two new Zendikar Rising precons facing up against two other powerful commanders from the set, resulting in the Sneak Attack and Land's Wrath decks wiping the floor with the others with their insane value. We definitely underestimated their power there, sending Peter away with even more points. Episode 10 brought back the homebrew game, letting anyone bring whatever deck they wanted. With some crazy plays from Caleb and with Landon and Griffin trying to control the board, Peter snuck in with his lightning fast Winota deck and domed everyone for his third win in a row. And finally, episode 11 introduced partners into the Duel of the Peaks game, having everyone choose two partners to build the strongest deck off of. Despite Caleb's tutors getting him all the right cards, Griffin was able to overwhelm the board with an insane number of copy spells and steal the game before anyone else could say infinite treasures. All right, with our recap out of the way, I'm turning it over to Landon to talk about our table challenges and our opening hands. Thank you, Peter, so much for that awesome recap. This has been an awesome year for Commander despite everything that went on with the world. We had so much fun playing with each other over Discord or in person whenever we could, and it was just a blast. So let's go over the table challenges for this game. So we've got the three point challenge, which is to win the game, and another three point challenge in casting your commander exactly once during the game. Our two point challenge will be to draw the most cards in a single turn, and our one point challenge will be have three legendary permanents on the battlefield under your control to take advantage of the commander legends. All right, so now I'll be going over the opening hands and also laying out the turn order. So Caleb is starting us off and he brought Jared Cartholian True Heir to the table. His opening hand consisted of a Blossoming Defense, a Colossal Majesty, a Beast Within, a Palace Sentinels, a Jungle Shrine, a Command Tower, and a Forest. And Caleb's personal challenge is to be the Monarch for three of his end steps in a row. 
Landon is going next, and he brought an Abomination of Lanowar deck, keeping an opening hand with a Tainted Strike, a Yuraga Tree Speaker, a Farhaven Elf, a Forest, and three Swamps. And Landon's personal challenge was to have his commander at 21 power. Peter's going third, bringing his Yorlock of Scorch Thrash to the table. His opening hand consisted of Wheel of Fate, a Gruel Signet, a Blood Moon, two Mountains, and two Swamps. His personal challenge was to mana burn each opponent for 10 damage. And finally, Griffin is bringing Obeka Brute Chronologist to the table. His opening hand consisted of Star Compass, Arcane Signet, Glimpse the Unthinkable, Desolation, Traumatize, and Two Swamps. His personal challenge was to exile four end of triggers on the stack. Let's go into the game. As I mentioned earlier, Caleb is going first, and he draws a card and plays on a jungle shrine tapped as his land for turn and passes to Landon. Landon draws and plays on a forest and taps it for a turn one Yuraga tree speaker. With nothing else, he passes to Peter. Peter draws and plays a mountain and passes to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays on a swamp and with nothing left, passes to Caleb. Caleb untaps his tap land and draws and plays on a command tower and with nothing else, passes to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays on a woodland cemetery and then taps both of his lands to level up his Yuraga Tree Speaker. It now has the ability to tap for two green mana. With nothing left, he sends the turn to Peter. Peter draws and plays on a swamp and taps all of his mana to suspend a Wheel of Fate. He exiles it and puts four time counters on it, meaning when the fourth time counter is pulled from it, he can cast it without paying its mana cost. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays another swamp and taps both of his swamps to play an arcane signet. With nothing left to do, he ships the turn to Caleb. Caleb draws and just has to flex and drops an alpha forest as his land for turn. And then he taps out to cast his commander, Jared, earning him three points for casting his commander once. When it enters, he makes Peter the monarch per Jared's enter the battlefield trigger. And with nothing left, he passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a swamp. And instead of swinging at Peter to gain the Monarch, he instead taps his Yuraga Tree Speaker and two lands to cast a Guardian Project. And then with nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and re removes a time counter from the Wheel of Fate in his upkeep. He draws and plays down a Swamp and then taps two mana for a Gruel Signet. With nothing left, he passes the turn and draws a card at his end step for being the Monarch. Peter is now in the lead with the most cards drawn in a single turn, which is kind of sad just at two cards, but hey, he's got two points, so. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a Mount as his land for turn and then taps out to cast his commander Obeka, getting him three points for casting his commander once. With nothing left, he passes to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws, and he plays on a planes as a land for turn and heads straight to combat, swinging Jared at Peter for a total of three damage. Peter takes it and Caleb takes the monarch back. In his second main phase, he pays three mana for a Colossal Majesty, and in his end step gets to draw a card for being the monarch, and with no other actions, Landon starts his turn. Landon untaps and draws and plays a forest. He then pays three mana for a Farhaven Elf. When this enters the battlefield, that will trigger his Guardian project, drawing him a card. And then the Farhaven ETB goes off and he searches his library for a swamp and puts it into play tapped. He then taps the rest of his mana for the Abomination of Lanowar, giving him three points for casting his commander once. This triggers the Guardian project again and he draws a third card this turn, granting him the lead on the two point challenge. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps, removing another counter from the Wheel of Fate in his upkeep, bringing it down to two. He draws and plays down a mountain. He then taps three mana for a Sulfuric Vortex and then passes the turn. Casting that Sulfuric Vortex has put everyone on the clock, including Peter, because it prevents the gaining of life and it'll slowly chip away at everybody's life total. So as soon as he gets your lock out and he's mana burning all of his opponents, we'll see that everyone is very quickly running out of life behind the scenes uh, due to the the, the vortex slowly chipping them down over lots of turns. He's got a lot of effects like that in his deck just waiting to happen. Griffin goes to his turn, untapping and taking two from the vortex in his upkeep. He draws and plays an island and then taps two mana for a star compass. He then taps two more mana for a glimpse the unthinkable. He targets himself and mills 10 cards from his library. The only noteworthy creature that ended up in his graveyard from this is a Diluvian Primordial, and with his opponents having empty graveyards, it's virtually useless to him. So he must keep digging if he wants to find any good reanimator targets. All right, with nothing left to do, Griffin ships the turn to Caleb. Caleb starts turn five, untapping and taking two from the Sulfuric Vortex. He draws and plays a Savannah for turn, continuing just to flex on the rest of us because I think that Savannah is probably more expensive than every other card on the table put together. <laughs> yeah. And quite possibly our decks. <laughs> uh, Caleb's been playing Magic for a lot longer than us. That, let's just say that. <laughs> yes, he, yes, he has. 
He then taps three mana to cast a Mimic Vat. He heads to combat, swinging Jared at Griffin for a total of three damage. And knowing that blocking is futile against Jared, Griffin just takes the three damage. And with nothing left, Caleb passes the turn, and in his end step, he will draw a card for being the Monarch. Landon untaps, also taking two from the Vortex, and draws. He plays a Tainted Wood as his land for turn, and then taps three mana to cast a Reclamation Sage, targeting Caleb's Mimic Vat. Guardian Project will trigger, and Landon draws a card. With that, he passes. Destroying the Mimic Vat was a pretty decisive move from Landon for two reasons. The first is that Landon's deck involves a lot of elves dying, and he didn't want Caleb to be able to take advantage of that. The second was so that Caleb doesn't get the chance to copy one of his own creatures that gives him the Monarch when it enters the battlefield. If he had one of those, he could easily steal the Monarch back when his opponents try to swing at him, making it that much harder to deal with Jared. Even though it might have made an enemy in Caleb to destroy his artifact, it was a pretty smart play from Landon. And in addition to that, I also knew that Caleb had packed his deck full of board wipes. And I knew that that Mimic Vat was going to get out of control if Caleb were to blow the board up and Griffin had reanimated a bunch of big nasty creatures from his graveyard. I didn't want Caleb getting them. And so I thought that it was just good to get rid of that Mimic Vat right here, right now. So Peter untaps and in his upkeep, he removes a time counter from the Wheel of Fate, bringing it down to one. And then he takes two damage from the Sulfuric Vortex. He draws and plays down a Swamp and then taps two Swamps for a Rakdos Signet. He then pays four mana for a Mana Barbs, which will start taxing everybody for tapping their lands. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps, taking two from the Vortex and draws. He plays down a Mountain and then pays five mana to cast Traumatize, targeting himself and milling half of his library. He taps four lands to pay for the Traumatize, so the Mana Barbs is going to deal four damage to him. So as that Traumatize is resolving, uh, we can see that the creatures that he mills are... Massacre Worm, Shieldred, Splinter Twin, Apprentice Necromancer, Vizier of Tumbling Sands, It That Betrays, Felden of the Third Path, Puppeteer Click, Kroxa, and Molten Primordial. Lots and lots of really good reanimation targets. He's got a lot of reanimator spells in his deck, so they are going to bring creatures out of his graveyard, and then he's going to have to return them at the beginning of the next end step, which is something that Obeka can stop from happening. That's the whole reason why he's trying to reanimate stuff in this Obeka deck, is because Obeka is really good at stopping things from going back to the graveyard. So. Self-mill is really powerful for him, and he really lucked out to have two self-mill cards, really powerful self-mill cards in his opening hand. Those self-mill cards might as well read draw X cards for however much they're milling him for, because mm -hmm. those cards in the graveyard are essentially as good as they are in his hand, and all of his reanimation spells are going to cost significantly less than it would cost to cast those creatures. So Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. so good. Ugh. With a filled graveyard, Griffin passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and takes two from the Vortex and draws a card. He then plays down an Exotic Orchard as his land for turn. Caleb is clearly not happy to see the Mana Barbs. It res it's restricting him quite a lot on the turn right before that Wheel of Fate is supposed to go off. It, that was a very smart move from Peter to kind of force everybody's hands like that. Uh, so Caleb is asking the table if anyone has a way to deal with the Mana Barbs. Landon says that he can destroy it with the Reclamation Sage that he already played, but he has an Eternal Witness in his hand. So if Caleb can get rid of his Reclamation Sage, Landon has a way to deal with the Mana Barbs. Following suit, Caleb heads into combat and swings Jared right at Landon, trusting that he'll keep his promise. <laughs> While Landon jokes that he could just let it go through, he blocks with the Reclamation Sage, letting it go to the graveyard. Caleb's Jared will get two plus one plus one counters on this, since Caleb is the Monarch and Jared was dealt damage, and in his second main phase, he plays a Regal Behemoth, taking six damage from the Mana Barbs, and he passes the turn. In his end step, he'll take his third Monarch draw in a row, so he'll be awarded two points for his personal challenge. And Landon, in response to Caleb's end step, will tap five mana for a return of the wild speaker, drawing him four cards and taking five damage from the mana barbs. Landon then goes to his turn, untapping and taking two more from the vortex. He draws and plays on a swamp as his land for turn, and then taps his tree speaker and a land to cast Eternal Witness, returning Reclamation Sage to his hand from the graveyard and taking one from the mana barbs. This also triggers the Guardian Project, giving him another card. He then taps three more mana to cast the Reclamation Sage, destroying Peter's mana barbs, taking three more damage from having to tap mana for the Sage. 
This will again trigger his guardian project and he will draw a card. That mana barbs was pretty short lived, but I feel like Peter got his mana's worth on that one. Every one of his opponents tapped their mana on their turns and managed to find a way to deal with it before it got back to him, meaning that he didn't have to take the heat from his own stacks piece. If he had to lose the barbs, that was the best time to do it. He then pays three more mana to cast Selvala, Heart of the Wilds, drawing another card from Guardian Project. Finally, Landon heads to combat and sends the Abomination of Lanamar at Griffin, who is unable to block it and takes 5 damage. Landon goes to his end step and discards to hand size. Peter untaps and takes 2 damage from the Vortex and removes the final time counter from Wheel of Fate, casting it for free and forcing everyone to discard their hands and draw 7. As we watch them discard, let's note that Caleb is really the biggest loser here. Griffin and Landon both have graveyard shenanigans where they can bring back stuff from the graveyard or they get credit for things being in the graveyard at least but the naya deck doesn't really have any of that especially with the mimic vac gone on top of that caleb discards three creatures that will give him the monarch which are a vital resource for him to keep the monarch and the main goal of his deck without drawing into more he could be stuck without a way to get the monarch back if he loses it Again. Peter then draws, and having drawn 8 cards this turn due to the Wheel of Fate, he is now in the lead for the card draw challenge. He then plays a Reliquary Tower as his land for turn, and then pays 4 mana to bring his commander out, Yurlock of Scorch Thrash, gaining him another 3 points. He then casts a Phyrexian Arena for 3 mana and then ships the turn to Griffin. Griffin with a fresh hand untaps and takes 2 more from the Vortex and then draws. He plays a Mountain and then taps 3 mana to cast a Corpse Dance. The top creature in his graveyard is a Sepulchral Primordial, so he brings it back and lets Corpse Dance resolve without buying it back. When the Primordial enters, he grabs Nadir, Agent of Duskenel, and Entourage of Trest from his opponent's graveyards, Peter having no creatures in his graveyard to reanimate. When the Entourage enters, Griffin will become the Monarch. He then pays 4 mana to cast an Identity Thief, and then he goes to his end step. The Monarch and Corpse Dance trigger, they go on the stack, and he orders them such that the Monarch will resolve, drawing him a card, and in response to the Corpse Dance trigger, he taps Obeka to end the turn, exiling that trigger from the stack so he gets to keep his Sepulchral Primordial. Caleb begins his turn untapping and takes 2 damage from the Vortex and draws a card from his Colossal Majesty since he has a creature with power 4 or greater. He then draws for turn and plays a Spire Garden as his land for turn. Now, at this point, Caleb does not have the Monarch, so his Regal Behemoth should not be doubling his mana, which is something that unfortunately none of us caught during the game, which leads to a lot of things happening on this turn that shouldn't have happened. We discussed these plays amongst ourselves and we decided to let this pass for several reasons and I won't spoil the rest of the game for you, but just let it be known, Discord presents different challenges that we're not really used to as a playgroup. So the game continues on and we're <laughs> learning to be more careful when we're playing over Discord, to say the least. So Caleb, under the assumption that he currently has the Monarch, taps a Plains to cast a Soul Ring and the Ozolith. He then taps the Soul Ring and two other lands, leaving one mana floating, to play an Inscription of Abundance Kit. He does the first and third modes, adding two plus one plus one counters on Jared, and then having Jared fight Griffin's Sepulchral Primordial. Five damage is marked on Jared, and the Primordial will go to the graveyard. He continues his turn by tapping the rest of his lands, presuming he has eight mana to spend, for an overwhelming stampede, giving both of his creatures plus seven plus seven, and trample until the end of turn. Using his remaining 3 mana, he casts Pariah, enchanting Jared, so that any damage done to Caleb will be instead be dealt to Jared. Caleb then goes to combat, and since he still has 1 mana in his mana pool, Yorlock triggers and Caleb will lose a life. Caleb decides to swing the Regal Behemoth and Jared at Griffin, and Griffin blocks with the Nadir that he stole from Landon's graveyard and the Entourage of Tress that he stole from Caleb's graveyard, sending them to their respective graveyards and taking 16 damage, going down to 3. When Nadir dies, Griffin will make three Elf Warrior tokens, and when <clears throat> and when Caleb deals combat damage to Griffin, he reassumes the Monarch. Caleb passes, drawing a card in his end step for being the Monarch. After that exciting turn, Landon untaps, taking two damage from the Vortex, and he draws his card for turn. He plays a Forest as his land for turn, and then taps it to cast a Lanoir Elves, drawing a card from the Guardian Project. He pays two mana for a Prowess of the Fair, and then pays three more mana for a Lead the Stampede, digging in the top five cards of his library for any number of creatures to put into his hand. He finds just one, a Yoraga Warcaller, and proceeds to cast it, kicking it once to put a plus one plus one counter on it, and this will trigger the Guardian Project, drawing him another card. He 
thinks about tapping the Sylvala, but he would be spent, he would be putting 10 mana in his mana pool and he can only use two of it, which means he would take eight damage from the Yorlock. So he decides not to do that. Landon instead heads directly into combat, swinging the Abomination at Peter for 10, who has no choice but to take it because it has Menace. With nothing left to do, Landon passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and takes two damage from the Sulfuric Vortex and loses one life to draw a card from the Phyrexian Arena, and then he draws for turn. Now, Peter really wants to deal damage to Caleb to get the Monarch away from him so that we can uh, start whittling away, getting rid of Jared, and, you know, any amount of protection that we can strip away from the Jared player is something that we should take. So Griffin proposes that Peter taps your luck to give Griffin the mana he needs to deal with it. Peter's pretty satisfied with that method to deal with Caleb because it doesn't hurt him too much and Griffin is happy because Peter isn't focusing on him when he's had such a low life total. Happy with the deal he's made, Peter heads straight into combat swinging your luck at Caleb. When Caleb does not block, Peter taps a reliquary tower to activate your luck, adding a red, a green, and a black to everyone's mana pool. Griffin then, before Caleb declares blockers, uses his mana to cast a chaos warp, targeting Jared to shuffle it back into Caleb's library. Caleb chooses to move it to the command zone instead, and after shuffling, he pulls a mage slayer off the top of his library and puts it onto the battlefield. The counters on Jared then move to the Ozolith when he leaves the battlefield, and with the Pariah gone, the damage resolves, and Caleb will take 4 damage from your lock. When combat ends, mana will empty from everyone's mana pool and Yurlock will deal 3 damage to Caleb, Landon, and Peter. In his second main phase, Peter casts a Magus of the Wheel and then passes the turn, drawing a card in his end set for being the Monarch. Griffin goes to his turn, untapping and taking 2 from the Vortex, going down to 1 life, and then he draws his card for turn. He heads straight into combat, swinging the Identity Thief at Peter. When it attacks, Griffin chooses to exile the Regal Behemoth to make the Thief a copy of it until the end of turn. Peter blocks the thief with Magus of the Wheel, but since the Behemoth has trampled, Peter will still take 2 damage. Griffin then becomes the Monarch, and in his second main phase, he taps 10 to cast Ginger Taxis, then taps the rest to cast Combustible Gear Hulk. Caleb chooses to let Griffin draw the 3 cards instead of taking however much damage that would be. Griffin then passes his turn, drawing 7 cards for Ginger Taxis and then 1 for being the Monarch. He then taps Obeka to end the turn, exiling the Identity Thief's trigger on the stack so that Caleb will not be getting his Regal Behemoth back. Griffin takes the 2 point challenge for drawing 12 cards in his turn, taking those 2 points from Peter. Griffin then discards down to hand size and then Caleb starts his turn. Caleb untaps and takes 2 damage from the Vortex and draws his card for turn. He then plays down a mountain and taps 4 mana for a guardian project of his own, and then taps 1 more mana for a birds of paradise, giving him a card from the project. He then taps the rest of his mana to recast Jared, losing his 3 points for having to recast his commander. He gets a card off of the guardian project, and then gives the monarch to Griffin who already had it. He goes to combat, not able to swing anything, but the Ozolith will trigger in the combat step and gives Jared his 4 plus 1 plus 1 counters back. Moving to his end step, he has to discard this hand due to the Jinja Taxis. Landon untaps and takes 2 mana from the Vortex and draws his card for turn. He then plays down a Swamp and then taps 2 mana for a Sylvan Library. He then pays 4 more mana to cast a Triumph of the Hordes, giving all of his creatures plus 1 plus 1, Trample, and Infect. Now, Landon has to think very carefully about who he's going to swing at, because he doesn't have enough gas to take everybody out with poison damage, unfortunately. Griffin is at one life, so he's not going to be able to live very far beyond the Sulfuric Vortex, so he isn't really considered a threat, uh, and, and Landon can't kill him with the one life now anyways because all of his creatures have an impact and, and there's just no way. So, it's either Peter or Caleb. Peter would certainly be easier to hit because he only has that one creature, but at the same time, he needs him alive if he wants Griffin not to pop off on this turn without having to deal with him, so that's the mindset that Landon is going through as he goes to combat. After thinking long and hard about his attacks, Landon heads to combat. He declares Farhaven Elf, Lanoir Elves, Reclamation Sage, Eternal Witness, and Yuraga Warcaller all at Caleb, and swings the Abomination of Lanoir at Griffin. Griffin blocks the Abomination with three of his Elf tokens from Nadir, and Caleb blocks the Yuraga Warcaller with Jared. Griffin gets 9 poison counters as a result, and Caleb takes more than 10 poison damage, so he is out of the game to infect. When the Warcaller dies, Prowess of the Fair will trigger, and Landon will get an elf token, and Landon becomes the Monarch since dealing infect to Caleb still counts as combat damage. Landon then passes, drawing a card from the Monarch, and having to discard his hand to Ginger Taxius. Rip in peace, Caleb. Rip in peace, Caleb. The, the, I, 
I love the Jared deck. I think it's a lot of fun to play against. Monarch is such a fun mechanic, and the fact that he gives it away for, at, when he comes into play, mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of unique in that aspect that you don't just get it and then suddenly become a target to everybody, but you have to give it away and then go after that person to get it back. That's a really, really cool concept for a deck, and, and so I was really excited to play against this deck. And he, he put up every wall that he could to try to stop us from from taking him out he he had a really strong presence but but the poison got him the poison got him as with a lot of commanders from commander legends i really like how they gave commanders that like wanted you to build around a certain strategy and really rewarded you for doing that i'm glad that like the naya commander wasn't just another like generic you know lands matter ramp matter play big creature mm -hmm. matters naya deck like this is really interesting and unique this isn't like every other naya deck and that that's the case with a lot of legendary creatures from commander legends they really did a good job like giving every color combination like really cool unique new commanders that didn't really exist beforehand and aren't just super generic a hundred percent agree and i can't give enough compliments to the design of jared i i think mm -hmm. he's one of the best naya commanders that we've seen for a while so pretty pretty cool so good good job caleb getting as far as you did uh i'm sorry that you had to get me taken out by infect I, he got lost in the sauce <laughs> he got lost <laughs> in the sauce <laughs> rip in peace Peter goes to his turn, untaps, and in his upkeep, he'll take three damage, two from the Vortex and one from the Phyrexian Arena, letting him draw an extra card, and then he draws his card for turn. He plays down a Savage Lands as his land for turn, and then taps his Reliquary Tower to activate Yorlock, giving everybody three mana in their mana pool. He uses that mana and three more to cast a Mana Reflection. In response to that cast, Griffin spends his borrowed mana to cast a Glorious End, attempting to end the turn. Peter responds to the glorious end by tapping the rest of his mana to cast a Comet Storm kicked enough to deal one damage to Griffin and one to Landon, eliminating Griffin from the game and exiling his end the turn spell on the stack. However, Peter being tapped out has no further actions and has to pass the turn to Landon, and Landon will take three damage from the Yorlock mana burn. Landon goes to his turn, feeling like victory is just within his grasps. He untaps and takes two damage from the Vortex. Sylvan Library will trigger in his draw step, and he will take eight life to keep all three cards, since Gingitaxis had completely emptied his hand on the last turn rotation. Not that he really needed those cards, because he simply heads straight into combat and sends his army of elves at Peter to finish him off. I win. Good job, Landon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. How much life was I at? Because I just remember in the game thinking, like, why did he not just Comet Storm blow my board up? Because, like, even if, <laughs> even if, like, you, like, the turn was ended, Griffin was going to die on his turn anyways. So Griffin could have kept going with Obeka. He could have prolonged <laughs> his life. <laughs> I mean, like, however shallow that is, he could have just kept on going to his upkeep and immediately ending the turn before exiling that vortex trigger on the stack. Uh, he could have done that forever. Uh, but, <laughs> this is but true. like, this I mean, like, true. you had such a strong board presence that you could have probably just swung through with him and, and, and yeah. dealt with him. I was uh -huh. getting low enough that even if I did Comet, bo Comet Storm your board and get rid of all of those elves... My Llanowar were, still would have been huge. Yeah, I couldn't have dealt with the Abomination of Llanowar, and they were, and, and that's the strength of it, really, is it doesn't matter how many board wipes you throw at that deck. It's Abomination of Llanowar is huge. And, mm -hmm. and so, I, with it having Menace and me having so few creatures, I couldn't have blocked it. There was no gotcha. way. And, and so... Okay. That makes yeah, sense. I, I was at a life total that... He, yeah, it, it just didn't make sense, especially with me ca uh, tapping your lock at the beginning of that turn uh, to cast mana yeah. reflection. Um, yeah, just, just like no calculation made sense to... Now, I had other options too in my hand. I had an Exsanguinate. Um, I had a mm -hmm. Torment of Hailfire. I just, yeah. there's so much going on on your board but you, that but you I had couldn't to deal with it fast enough. at instant speed. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Yeah, and and hi, him him undermining my entire turn uh, by getting rid of that mana reflection and having your lock tapped. It's something that I couldn't let let go. So that's well, why and I what's had to what's really interesting is like even even had you just torment of, of hellfire and done nothing else with your turn, thinking mm -hmm. like that would have been enough to kill both Griffin and me. Griffin still would have cast that glorious end. 
Yeah. Even even though it would have killed me, it also would have killed him. So there was really no position for you to take us both out at the same time. You, mm-hmm. you didn't you didn't know that though. But, yeah, I was um, I was backed in a corner at that that mm-hmm. point. Yeah, and 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 yeah, I actually when I tapped out to cast that comet storm, it didn't even register that I tapped out and that I was about to die <laughs> um, until until everything resolved and and I was <laughs> like, oh, I have the rest of my turn left. Oh wait, I'm tapped no. out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, jeez. <laughs> and it's interesting because I think I was only the monarch once during that game. Maybe, mm-hmm. may, maybe twice. So people weren't really attacking me because, like, there was... It's not that there wasn't an incentive, it's just that everybody else was more enticing because you wanted to be the monarch. Mm-hmm. Um, and I spent the whole game with very little interaction, very little interaction on my side of the board. Like, I don't think anybody really picked off anything that I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um which you can't really do that against an elf deck. <laughs> so, Landon, what do you think about the play of the game? So, I'm going to give myself just a little pat on the back here, because <laughs> I think the play of the game was me blowing up the mana barbs, and, like, the overextension I had to do to blow it up. Having to, like, let my Reclamation Sage die, regrowth it back to my hand with the Eternal Witness, having to play both of those spells with the mana barbs out, taking all of that damage just to blow up one permanent... That was a lot, but I really think that that mana barbs needed to go. Um, I think that would have dealt way more damage to everybody throughout the game. And I think cutting it off right there really probably saved the rest of the table. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I would have done more hurt to myself than, than to anybody else. Um, mm-hmm. So like in that re- regard, it saved me as well. I know that Griffin and Caleb were both tapping tons of mana to do lots of things on their turn, and it would have taken them down really, really quickly. So yeah, I took yeah. eight damage Changed that the turn. Game. So so yeah. I I think that was the play of the game. Pat myself. Let's on go. The back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good, <laughs> good job. <laughs> okay, and for the MVP card of the game, I will go ahead and give myself a pat on the back and give it to Sulfuric Vortex. Um, like I said in the beginning, it was dwindling down everybody's life in the back background, and really, I think the key was that nobody could gain any life. I I know that at least Caleb could have done it. I wouldn't be surprised if Obeka could have done it somehow. You know, but yeah, regaining. I had I had ways. I had tons of ways in my in my deck of gaining a bunch yeah, of life. It, so it's elves. Yeah, yeah. So so I th- I think blocking that at the very least was was high impactful but really the, the the reason why we're giving it to the sulfuric vortex is because it was there the whole game it made such a huge impact on the the whole course of the game ended up doing 12 damage to everybody at least just just a three mana enchantment that came out on turn three and just, just whittled everybody down uh, i yeah i think it's a, a great include for for your luck and it fits better there than a lot of decks i, I feel like because burn isn't really a, a fashionable thing in in commander but sulfuric vortex works really well with your luck all right so with those post thoughts out of the way let's tally up the points for today's episode so caleb got a total of two points for hitting his personal challenge of being the monarch on three of his end steps in a row bringing him up to 40 points Landing gets three points for casting his commander once, and three points for winning the game, bringing him from 38 to 44. Griffin earned three points for casting his commander once, and two points for drawing the most cards in a single turn, so he goes from 52 points to 57 points. And Peter just earns three points for casting his commander only once, bringing him from 60 to 63 points. And with that, Peter is the grand champion for the season. He has got the most points at the end of 12 games, and he has done a very, very, very good job of going for the points and also trying to win the game while keeping the decks personalized and playing how he likes to play. And it's been a ton of fun to get stomped by him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> thank you landon i um i am honored we've got a play mat that we're making for the champion that you'll see next season i'll be i'll be sporting it the whole season and then i'll be sporting it the season after that so yeah <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I, I, I certainly hope so. I certainly I hope I don't have to wear this crown for too long. It's heavy. <laughs> it's, it's a heavy crown. Thank you guys so much for watching this video, and we'd like to give a huge thank you to all of our subscribers and all of our Patreons. This has been an amazing year for us. We are super excited and super humbled by all of the support that we've gotten and for this community that we've been building. It's a ton of fun. We've really loved this. And if you'd like to become a Patreon, you can head on over to patreon.com slash command value. This supports us directly. You get access to exclusive content, really cool merch, our Discord, and a bunch of other perks. Another reminder about our sponsor, GameGrid, and going to the link in the description below will help the channel out and you can get singles from Commander Legends or other singles that you need for your Commander decks and they now ship nationwide so you can get them anywhere here in America. Another quick reminder that we are live streaming every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time and you can join us on Arena for some brawl and our social medias are Command Valley P1 and you can like us on Facebook and the links for all of those will be in the description. And again, I just want to give one more thank you to all of our subscribers, viewers, and Patreons. We really do appreciate you guys. We hope you enjoy this episode and we hope you guys have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you for watching all throughout this season. We hope you didn't miss anything and you can go back and watch any of those we have a playlist of all of our duel of the peaks episodes that you can check out on our channel we hope to see you next year have a merry christmas